Welcome to the next video, Principles of Biomarker Testing. This is also a three-part segment, and in this first part, we'll be talking about tissue testing, or the gold standard of how biomarkers are tested. In the how do we diagnose and how do we stage videos, we went through an endoscopy, an upper endoscopy, and that this is typically how the cancer is diagnosed with the endoscopist, either for an esophageal cancer or a stomach cancer, visualizing a cancer mass in the lumen inside uh, the tube of the esophagus and stomach. From there, a biopsy is taken with a forceps that, that is on the end of the probe, and that biopsy is then processed and made into a formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded block. And that is shown here, where the tissue is obtained, a block is made of the tissue that it's fixed in that setting, so the cancer cells are now frozen and, and no longer alive. And this is what it looks like in real life. There's often a number of different biopsy pieces uh, put together in this block. From there, that block can be sliced in really thin sections with the microtome, um, usually like four or five microns thick. And then the pathologist will have those each slide stained with something called H&E. &E. And that's shown here where the two different stains are um, hematoxylin, which stains nuclei of cells purple, and eosin, which stains the rest of things pink. And so from that, the pathologist can then look under the microscope and evaluate the tissue biopsy for cancer cells. In addition to that, extra slides or blank slides are, are cut, and those slides are often used by the pathologist to help with getting the diagnosis with specific tests for specific protein expression profiles. And this is called immunohistochemistry. This uses antibody technology, which is what we've talked about in the principles of the immunotherapy segment. But these antibodies are not therapeutic. They're not being used to treat the cancer, but rather they're being used to help determine whether there's expression of a given protein. So similar to all of the antigen and epitope discussion that we had, an antibody will be specific to any given protein of interest. So an antibody to CK7, for example, would be used and usually is overexpressed uh, in uh, esophageal and gastric cancers, for example. And so from this panel of testing, the pathologist can help to come to a clinical diagnosis. It typically takes around three days from the processing and then the evaluation of these slides to come up with uh, a diagnosis. Now, these slides that are obtained and, and uh, used are called the clinical slides, and they're stored along with the original block, any remaining tissue that's there after the cutting, in the pathology department of wherever this biopsy uh, was taken and sent to that institution. And those are kept there for decades. So these are referred to as the clinical slides. And these slides then, when we talked about in the video on obtaining second opinions, if we go to an academic center, for example, we would have the clinical slides obtained from the original pathology department, and they would be sent to the academic center where you're getting a second opinion. And the pathologist there would review the pathology slides, the clinical slides, and confirm what has been uh, observed by the original pathologist. Occasionally, the second opinion of pathologist will obtain a few extra slides that are blank and perform some other diagnostic stains of other proteins to really confirm um, any suspicions. And so ultimately, though, these clinical slides um, would be then sent back to the original pathologist group after the second opinion is performed. So this is the example when we talked about how do we diagnose gastroesophageal cancer, the pathologist would then look under the microscope, and these are the H&E stains that would help to differentiate between normal and cancerous tissue, would help to determine the histological subtype, like we talked about intestinal type and diffuse type, or if there were mixed um, features of that. And similarly, for esophageal cancer, they would be able to determine if there's cancer and if there's a background of Barrett's metaplasia, for example. And in addition to the endoscopic biopsy, it is not uncommon that we obtain tissue from other sites, metastatic sites, using something called core needle biopsies. So a very common 
example of that would be an ultrasound guided biopsy, usually by a radiologist who would put an ultrasound probe, say for example, if there were liver masses um, on the liver to evaluate and visualize those masses. And then they would use a core needle to get a biopsy. And so this is an example of an ultrasound of the liver and this is an abnormal mass that the radiologist can visualize. And then in the next image, we see that the needle is entering into that mass and obtaining that core biopsy. So this is a schematic of what would happen. The needle is obtained from the outside or percutaneous biopsy. And this is what it would look like after obtaining that core uh, biopsy. Then those cores would be fixed in formalin and place in a paraffin embedded block. And it's not uncommon to get multiple core biopsies to really get an adequate assessment of the sample. And then similar to an endoscopic biopsy with a microtome would create thin slides and then stained with H&E. And then the pathologist can evaluate under the microscope and determine normal liver cells versus cancer cells as an example. In addition to an ultrasound guided biopsy, you may have a CT guided biopsy, which is usually performed by an interventional radiologist. And this is an example of a lung nodule that's visualized on a CAT scan. And the, the radiologist would be using um, an, a concurrent CAT scan at the time of getting a biopsy and visualizing the mass on the CT scan and then obtaining that core biopsy. In addition to that, Sometimes we have metastatic sites inside the belly cavity, in the back of the belly cavity called the retroperitoneal space in lymph nodes there. And so remember, these are the kidneys, these two uh, uh, structures here. This is the vertebral column, and these would be the abnormal lymph nodes that we're trying to uh, obtain a biopsy from. And now in this next image, uh, the patient is lying on their belly and their back is up uh, upwards, and the needle is being inserted and obtaining a biopsy of that lymph node. So either way, this tissue is then processed in a very similar manner with the core biopsies, formalin fixed and paraffin embedded in a block, and then evaluated um, with a microtome looking at the slides with H&E. Finally, another source of tissue, of course, is a surgical resection. And so this is an example of a cancer that's in the far end or the distal end of the stomach. And this is the surgical procedure that's this part of the stomach is removed. So it's a subtotal gastrectomy. Part of the stomach is, is uh, kept in place. And then the remaining parts of the stomach is, are connected to the small bowel uh, in a procedure called a bill Roth II anastomosis. And so this part of the stomach is then evaluated by the pathologist. In addition to the primary tumor being removed, we will learn when we talk about principles of surgery that the surgeon will also systematically remove all of the regional lymph nodes. And we'll talk about D1 lymph nodes, which are really nearby, and D2 lymph nodes, which are a little bit further away. And an adequate surgery entails removing all of these. And then the pathologist will then go through all the tissue and remove these lymph nodes. And then the most important thing to understand from a surgical resection is that there will be multiple blocks that are created from various sections of the cancer and other parts that are removed. For example, there will be the main part of the cancer, sometimes the leading edge of the cancer. Each one would have a block, for example. Importantly, we would have the proximal margin and the distal margin to make sure that there's no cancer left at each end to ensure that there was a bit an adequate resection. There would also be lymph nodes and every uh, lymph node would uh, often be its own block or a couple of lymph nodes would be placed in a block um, as well as the D2 lymph nodes. And the point here is that there'll be multiple blocks from a given surgery that would then each have sections and slides made looked at by H&E by the pathologist to come up with a formal pathologic stage that we talked about in how and why do we stage the cancer. So with all of these different biopsies, whether it be an endoscopic biopsy, whether it be a core needle biopsy that's ultrasound guided or CT guided, or from a surgical specimen, we would have tissue. That tissue would be formalin fixed and paraffin embedded. And then clinical slides would be obtained and stained with H&E 
to evaluate under the microscope by the pathologist to assess um, the, whether there's cancer and the degree of cancer. Now, in addition to that, and now we'll be talking about biomarker testing, the pathologist will have other slides made and stained for specific biomarkers. And we're going to go through each one of these in turn. And so we're going to talk about prognostic versus predictive biomarkers and what that means. So a prognostic biomarker is a biomarker that will help to anticipate the expected outcome of the cancer. So as an example, a, bi a biomarker can simply be a patient who is originally diagnosed with stage four gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma that has a relatively low burden of cancer disease, just one small liver lesion, for example, that is known to be metastatic disease, has a better prognosis than a patient who's also diagnosed with stage four gastroesophageal cancer, but has multiple liver spots and also other places of spread, like for example, the lung, the bone, and the peritoneal cavity. So this is a biomarker that is prognostic. It doesn't necessarily help to predict whether therapy is gonna be effective or not, but it is just a known prognostic biomarker. Another example of a biomarker that is uh, prognostic is whether or not a patient's tumor has mismatch repair deficiency. We talked about that in the mismatch repair deficiency video and that deficient mismatch repair, which goes in along with MSI high tumors, portends a better prognosis compared to those tumors that don't have deficient mismatch repair, or in other words, are proficient in mismatch repair and microsatellite state. And we talked about this in the immunotherapy videos where the main mutations that occur in this abnormality is frame shift mutations, which lead to many proteins that are immunogenic and leads to an, a strong immune response. And so after surgery, patients that have mismatch repair deficiency tend to have a better prognosis, all else equal, compared to those who do not. In contrast, a predictive biomarker is a marker that will help to determine or predict whether a specific therapy will or will not work. So the classic example in gastroesophageal cancer would be HER2 positivity. Those patients who have a cancer that's HER2 positive would be predicted to have therapeutic benefit uh, from anti-HER2 therapies. Uh, another example is a tumor that has high PDL1 expression. This will typically have a better chance or have a higher predictive value in terms of therapeutic benefit from immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors to anti-PD-1 or anti-PDL1. In contrast, a tumor that's HER2 negative or a tumor that's PDL1 low or negative would predict lack of benefit, or this is a negative predictive biomarker um, to the respective targeted therapy to those biomarkers. So the next point to say is that a biomarker can be predictive like HER2, but not prognostic. Whether or not your tumor is HER2 positive or negative doesn't really have a prognostic association, but it does have a predictive value. And similarly, some biomarkers can be both prognostic and predictive. So an example of that is mismatch repair deficiency in MSI high. A tumor that has that, we just talked about, has a good prognosis just at baseline. And with uh, immunotherapy drugs, this is a positive predictive value. If you have this, this is a very high chance that the therapy will work to control the cancer. Similarly, we can have negative prognostic biomarkers. An example of that, we talked about MET tyrosine kinase in the targeted therapy video and tumors that are overexpressing and certainly that have gene amplification of this uh, gene called MET have a worse prognosis compared to those tumors that don't have this abnormality in MET. And the last point to make is that some biomarkers can be modified. So an example is amongst patients with HER2 positive cancers, those that have a concurrent MET abnormality would be predicted to have less benefit from anti-HER2 therapies compared to a patient's tumor that has HER2 positivity, but not a MET abnormality. So as you can see, multiple biomarkers need to be assessed. And then what the profile is can help to determine both the prognostic outcome and or the predictive benefit from various targeted and immunotherapies. So with that said, in order to understand biomarkers, we really need to understand and why I've always gone back to this central dogma of biology, 
that DNA is the blueprint of everything, and that this DNA can be transcribed to RNA and translated to protein, and that abnormalities in the DNA can then manifest in oncogenic changes in the protein level. And we talked about how the four main types of genetic alterations occur across the various chromosomes, and that the four main types of alterations include gene copy number changes, amplification, which is very common in gastroesophageal cancer, or deletions of large portions of chromosomes, usually in tumor suppressors, single base pair changes that lead to an activating change or um, um, inactivating of a tumor suppressor, small amounts of DNA inserted or deleted from a gene that usually leads to inactivation, and again, MSI high um, mismatch repair deficient tumors often have these types of mutations uh, and changes that lead to frame shift changes that lead to large chunks of abnormal protein that are immunogenic. And then finally, we can have rearrangements that lead to a fusion of, of different parts of the chromosome and replacement of DNA into different areas that can be oncogenic. And so it is not uncommon to have a combination of these things going on across a number of genes in any given tumor. And so then we talked about how these genetic changes then will lead to altered function of proteins, activation of oncogenes, inactivation of tumor suppressors, that then leads to a, a, a malignant growth. And we can check for these genetic abnormalities at the level of the DNA by isolating the DNA and sequencing it. We can also check for these abnormalities through the various steps of the central dogma, we can check for abnormalities in the RNA, and we can check for the abnormalities at the level of the protein. And what we're going to talk about for the rest of the talk is for the various biomarkers of interest, whether or not we're testing the DNA or the protein or both. Now, remember, we talked about how the genetic events can be tested in some cases either at the DNA or the protein level, or both. An example of that would be gene amplification. So I'll show you HER2, where we could check for whether or not there's increased copies of HER2 in the DNA. But we also know that gene amplification leads to extremely high expression of its protein, HER2, and we could test for it at the level of the protein. And on the other hand, on the flip side, some abnormalities that we're going to be testing for are tested only at the level of the protein because their gene, for the most part, is normal. And so examples of that would be PDL1 expression, which is by protein expression, and Claudin 18.2, which we'll go through. Now, generally, the gene DNA testing is traditionally from cancer biopsies, as we've been going through. But in the next video, we're also going to talk about how we can do a blood draw and obtain DNA that's floating around from the cancer cells or circulating tumor DNA and assess uh, the DNA from that perspective as well. But again, the traditional way of doing this testing would be from obtaining a cancer tissue sample and assessing the DNA from there. In contrast, for protein, generally the protein tests are being done on tissue samples and not validated routinely at this point um, from blood draws. And so an example again is HER2 gene amplification and consequent HER2 over expression of the protein that can be tested either at the at the level of the DNA where we're looking to see what the copy number of the genes are and or if there's overexpression um, at the level of the protein. So recall in the video on targeted therapies that we went through various targeted therapies available for gastroesophageal cancer and we talked about HER2 being a biomarker of benefit to an antibody therapy called trastuzumab or Herceptin. And we talked about cell signaling and how gene amplification leads to an oncogenic growth in that in a normal cell, you'll have two copies of HER2 and a normal amount of HER2 protein at the receptor of the cell. On the other hand, if you have gene amplification of HER2, you have too many copies of, of HER2 genes in the nucleus and these are being transcribed and translated into a huge amount of protein at the receptor that starts to signal inappropriately and constitutively all the time. And recall 
that HER2 amplification occurs in about 10 to 15% of gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma. It's about 10% of stomach cancer, about 15, even up to 20% of esophageal gastric junction adenocarcinoma. But that other receptor tyrosine kinases like MET, EGFR, and FGFR2, and their incidences here, are very similar in that they, when their gene is amplified, they have overexpression of their receptor protein, and that leads to a constitutive activation. These genes are usually the driver of the cancer, but we do see concurrent amplification of some of these uh, genes in a given patient's cancer, and therefore, there's more than one oncogene signaling at any given time. Now, remember that when this protein at this receptor is constitutively active, it leads to a signaling cascade through downstream molecules that then reprogram the cell nucleus through transcription factors that turn on genes that then help proliferate, help with cell survival, help with motility, invasion of the cancer cells. And so this upregulation of or turning on of oncogenic gene profiles, the genes that are doing this aren't abnormal if you were to sequence them, but they're upregulated at the level of the DNA in the nucleus and being turned on. So this is an example of proteins that would be highly expressed but won't be genetically abnormal at the DNA level. They're just being turned on more by the oncogene that is abnormal in the DNA. So HER2 is gene amplified. It leads to signaling. It leads to a change in transcription factor profile that turns on a whole bunch of genes through transcription, then translation, so that there's increased proteins that are conducive to proliferate, to cell survive, anti-apoptosis or anti-cell death, and increase invasion. So back to HER2, how do we test for it at the level of the tissue? The first way is through protein expression with a test of immunohistochemistry for a diagnostic antibody to HER2. It's different than the therapeutic antibody trastuzumab, but it is a diagnostic antibody of which there are a number that are validated. And the pathologist will stain the slide and will look for uh, two main components. The first is how strong of a staining do they see on a scale from zero to three? The three being the strongest intensity of staining and zero being no staining and the intermediate in between. The second component is how much of the tumor is staining? What is the percent of the cancer cells staining for HER2? An example it would be 75% of the cells are staining and the remainder are not. And so when we get to the biomarker video on tumor molecular heterogeneity, this is the first introduction showing that it is quite common for some of the cells to stain positively and others not. And that is the nature of cancer that it is always changing with every cell division. Some cells retain HER2 positivity, some cells lose it, for example. And so it is very common to see heterogeneity in the sample. And as a consequence, the recommendation is to have a number of biopsy specimens obtained, for example, from an endoscopic biopsy, a minimum of five and multiple forcep biopsies should be obtained to get an optimal evaluation to assess for the presence or absence of HER2. And what's shown here is that after a certain number of biopsies, the sensitivity of finding HER2 positivity plateaus and getting more doesn't help. But certainly, if you have very few biopsies, you could miss positivity of the sample. So this is an example of biomarker heterogeneity with HER2. And the reason, again, to test for HER2 is as a predictive biomarker for benefit from anti-HER2 therapies. In addition to being able to test for HER2 at the protein level by immunostochemistry or IHC, we talked about that we can look at the level of the DNA. And one of the traditional ways of looking for HER2 positivity or gene amplification is by a test called FISH or fluorescence in situ hybridization, where what's going on is we have two different pieces of DNA. One is specific for HER2 and one is specific for the chromosome on which HER2 resides, which is chromosome 17. And this chromosome enumerating probe, or CEP17, 
is specific to chromosome 17. And so the fish assay is looking for how many copies of HER2 are in any given nucleus. And so each of these circles is a different cell in its nucleus and how many copies of chromosome 17 are there. And remember, in a normal cell, there should be two copies of chromosome 17 and two copies of the HER2 gene. So this is a normal cell. In contrast, a cancer cell that has HER2 gene amplification usually will have two or three copies of the CEP17 probe, yet it will have numerous copies of HER2 in red. And so this is an example of high-level gene amplification with many, many copies of HER2 in a given cell and lower level, but still HER2 amplified gene copy number. And so we can get the gene copy number and the CEP17 number. And then ultimately the final score of whether or not this is amplified is the ratio of the HER2 copy number to the copy number of CEP17. And by definition, a HER2 amplified tumor will have a ratio of two or more. We also know that as a predictive biomarker, the, the higher this ratio, the more likely that HER2 therapy will be effective and for a longer duration. So how do we test for HER2 routinely? The standard way to do this testing is to start with immunostochemistry and assess for expression of the protein, both by intensity and extensity. So in the setting where a tumor has really high expression or three plus expression in at least 10% of the cells, then this would be considered positive and no further testing is required. Similarly, if a tumor has really low expression in the majority of the cells, then this is considered negative and no further testing is required. It is only when there's two plus expression um, in 10% or more of the cells that then the recommendation is to reflex to fish testing as a tiebreaker, determine the fish ratio of HER2 to CEP17 to determine if it's actually amplified or not. And the reason for this staged testing, uh, first pass with immunostochemistry and then only fish in the two plus positive tumors is because the majority of cases are either three plus or low low of expression. And so we can spare a lot of the tissue from being tested by fish. But in addition to that, um, the fish testing tends to be a little bit more time consuming, a little bit more operator dependent. And so uh, limiting its use to just those that are considered equivocal or two plus has been the typical way that HER2 testing is performed in the clinic routinely. So what about other biomarkers that we test for? Well, other targeted therapies like ramucirumab for um, antiangiogenesis does not have a known predictive biomarker. And so there's no routine recommended biomarker test to determine who is eligible for this therapy. All patients are eligible for this therapy, as we'll see when we get to treatment in the metastatic setting. However, um, a recent study called the Spotlight Study, which is a global study looking at a therapy, Zolbituximab, for Claudin 18.2 protein expression, um, was recently positive and will be expected to be uh, available for patients in the near future. So remember that Claudin is a protein that is in the tight junctions that keeps cells connected to each other. And the mechanism of action of the therapeutic antibody solbituximab is an antibody that binds specifically to Claudin 18.2. And for the most part, as far as we understand, works through eliciting an immune response through the back end of the antibody, that FC domain, by dragging in immune cells like natural killer cells, NK cells, that then mediate antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, or ADCC. And this study, called the Spotlight Study, evaluated all patients that were screening to be eligible for the study and only patients that had tumors that had high protein expression were eligible. And it turns out that about 30 to 35% of patients have overexpression of this protein. This diagnostic antibody immunostochemistry assay was tested concurrently in the study and is expected to be approved as a companion diagnostic when zolbituximab is approved as a therapeutic option. And so this assay should become routinely available 
that the pathologist would be using in addition to all of the other tests that are routine, including HER2, as we just talked about. Finally, it should be noted that the gene is usually normal if you were to do gene sequencing, and it is the protein that's overexpressed. So it's an example of where to test for this biomarker, we need to test at the level of the protein. However, as noted here, there are a small subset, less than 3%, uh, it is estimated, that would have gene fusion of Claudin 18.2, which is an abnormality. And this usually tracks with diffuse type signet ring tumors. And so if you were to do gene sequencing, you may also identify Claudin abnormalities in a small percentage. But again, I just wanna highlight that to be eligible for the therapy, you need to have high protein expression as determined by the specific diagnostic immunostochemistry assay. And again, the reason for this testing is because the spotlight study confirmed that it is a predictive biomarker of benefit from this zolbituximab anti-clodin 18.2 antibody. The next biomarker um, to talk about is mismatch repair testing. And recall from the video on deficient mismatch repair that these enzymes go back and proofread our DNA. And if you've lost expression of these proteins through various means, whether it's mutation of, of these particular genes or through down regulation, so the gene is turned off, it's not being transcribed, so there's none around. Uh, either way, the protein is not functioning and therefore you have mismatch repair deficiency. This occurs in about 3% of patients with gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma that have stage four disease and a little bit higher incidence in locally advanced stage two and three gastroesophageal cancers at around seven or 8%. And so the top example is a tumor that is mismatch repair deficient because it has lost expression of MLH1 and PMS2. In contrast, this is an example below of a different patient's tumor that has normal expression of MLH1 and PMS2, but has loss of expression of MSH2 and MSH6. The final consequence is mismatch repair deficiency, but different uh, mismatch repair genes are affected. And so immunostochemistry is a quick way to assess four different proteins to evaluate for mismatch repair status. Recall, that this is only one of many ways to assess for this abnormality because as just pointed out, in many cases, the gene is mutated. And so by gene sequencing, we can assess for the same abnormality, but also recall from the video that microsatellite instability high goes hand in hand with deficient mismatch repair. And by doing gene sequencing and identifying for this is another way of assessing the same biomarker. And finally, because mismatch repair leads to hypermutation profile, lots of mutations all throughout the cancer DNA in that cell, tumor mutation burden by gene sequencing can also act as a surrogate and identify mismatch repair because it would have a large number of mutations and therefore a high tumor mutation burden. Again, the reason for testing mismatch repair status is because first, it can tell us about prognosis. Typically, this would be for the locally advanced setting in terms of whether or not a patient needs uh, chemotherapy before and or after surgery, as we'll talk about in future videos. But also in the metastatic setting, as a predictive biomarker of benefit to immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors, anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1 antibodies. Finally, speaking of anti-PD-L1 antibodies, is the PDL1 biomarker. PDL1 is a very strong negative predictive biomarker of benefit if you have a low level expression of PDL1. And so, how do we score PDL1? PDL1 is a specific antibody, diagnostic antibody, of which there are a number of validated antibodies at this point that are different again from the therapeutic antibodies like pembrolizumab, Keytruda, Nivolumab, Opdivo, and all the others. These are different antibodies that are specifically designed for immunostochemistry, and they are applied to the tissue section. And the pathologist can stain whether or not a tumor cell is staining positive or negative, but they can also assess whether immune cells infiltrating the tumor are present, number one, 
and whether or not they are staining or not to PDL1. And you can see here um, in the depictions here that um, a negative versus a low expressor versus a moderate versus a very strong expressor by immunostochemistry. But it is the combined positivity score that is routinely shown predictive value in terms of benefit from checkpoint inhibitors. And it is the combined positivity score because it is looking at the positivity of cells that are not only tumor cells, but also infiltrating lymphocytes and macrophages, infiltrating immune cells. And then it is divided by the number of viable tumor cells in that given sample that you're assessing. And it's a, a times 100 as a percentage. And so what we do know in terms of incidence is that if we look at gastroesophageal adenocarcinomas, all comers, depending on which study or which sample cohort we're evaluating, generally speaking, the tumors that have a score of one or higher are about 50 to 60% of all the tumors. Five or higher, 30 to 40%, 10 or higher, 10 to 15% of all the tumors. And we know that the higher the level of CPS scoring, the more likely the benefit from immuno checkpoint inhibitors. In contrast, those tumors that have really low expression or negative usually don't have a response. As a predictive biomarker, the, the strongest predictive value is if it is zero or less than five, certainly, that the chance of benefiting from immunotherapies is extremely low, if not zero. It is rather those that are higher than 10 that have a subset of those will derive some benefit from immune checkpoint inhibitors. And the last point to make about PDL1 is that this is another example, again, that it has to be tested at the level of the protein on a tissue biopsy um, because it's looking at expression in cancer cells and immune cells uh, and that there's no validated biomarker, say, from the blood or from the gene uh, DNA sequencing to assess for PDL1. Again, this is a predictive biomarker for benefit or lack of benefit to immune checkpoint inhibitors. So the next thing to talk about when we talk about biomarker testing from tissue, we've spoken about the specific biomarkers that are indicated in gastroesophageal cancer, particularly in the newly diagnosed stage four setting. But in addition to that, we can obtain gene sequencing at the level of DNA. So how is that done? Well, starting from the same block of tissue that's formalin fixed and paraffin embedded, DNA can be obtained from that sample. And then it can be run through a sequencer to do next generation sequencing and identify a number of different genetic problems in that particular cancer. Now, in contrast to the relatively quick turnaround time of immunous chemistry and even FISH, which is around five days, the turnaround time of doing next generation sequencing from the time that the DNA is put into the sequencer is around 10 to 14 days. And often there's a delay in terms of getting the sample to where the sequencing needs to be done. And so it's not uncommon for these results to take several weeks, even a month to get the results back. So why would we do next generation sequencing? Well, if we look back to the typical way of looking at molecular changes in cancer, and trying to identify the four main types of genetic alterations at the level of the gene. We could identify base substitutions and small insertions and deletions by type of sequencing called capillary sequencing or Sanger sequencing, which was very low throughput, looking at one gene at a time, looking at one area of the gene at a time. And to identify gene amplifications, we needed to do a different test, either immunostochemistry to look downstream at the protein expression or at the gene level fish, which we just described. And then for the fourth alteration type, the gene fusions, usually that would be done by a separate fish assay. And so this was slow going one at a time a la carte testing. And so as we've learned that there are many different genes that can be involved and to have to try and assess for all the different genes for the four different types of alterations, this became cumbersome and, and often not possible because there's not enough tissue to do each of these tests. And so this was the answer was next generation sequencing, which was the new type of technology that came around that uses an onco panel, it's called, that can assess for hundreds of genes at a given time for all four of these different alterations simultaneously. So it can be considered tissue economic and also can save time in the end 
because you're getting all this information simultaneously. And so examples of tissue-based next generation sequencing panels that are commercially available are listed here. Um, in addition to that, many centers, typically academic centers, will provide a very similar type of next generation sequencing panel. Uh, and so th these are now becoming very routinely available. And because they're more comprehensive and getting more information from the same amount of tissue, they've replaced, in, in most cases, doing things a la carte. This is an example then of an onco panel that's commercially available um, by Foundation Medicine called Foundation One. And the only reason why I show this one is because I could find uh, uh, um, a, an example online um, that's de-identified. And so the first thing to note is that there are redundancy on these panels. Like for example, HER2, which has already been tested for at the level of the protein by immunostochemistry and or by fish. The mismatch repair proteins have already been tested by immunostochemistry, but here we can do gene sequencing for those to see if there's mutation. And so there's some redundancy of these panels, but at the same time, we can also get a lot more information. For example, there are gene oncogenes like BRAF and BRCA1 and 2 tumor suppressor genes, CDH1 tumor suppressor gene, EGFR gene amplification, HER3 mutation and amplification, FGFR2 mutation and amplification, KRAS mutation and amplification, MET gene mutation and amplification, other genes that lead to hypermutated profile like pol d and pol e RET mutations, which um, can be activating, and also this panel below of gene fusions like with FGFR, NTREC, RET, and ROS. And so each of these genes can have therapeutic options if they are present. In addition to that, we talked about tumor mutation burden and also that we can assess for microsatellite instability or not. And so again, another redundancy compared to the low throughput assays like immunostochemistry looking for mismatch repair. And so it's ultimately considered complementary because it can add a lot of information that we hadn't received yet by the low throughput immunostochemistry and FISH assays. And it can be confirmatory for some of the assays that were already performed. Uh, but ultimately, uh, this is an example of a report after sequencing a sample for all of these different genes and ultimately showing abnormalities in these genes listed here. And actually in this case, a high tumor mutation burden, usually that's defined as higher than 10 mutations per megabase. And on commercial assays, they will also list any FDA approved therapies that are associated with the genetic abnormalities identified. And also whether or not there's therapies commercially available, but not necessarily approved for this particular aberration in this particular tumor type. And then also lists um, various clinical trials that you may be eligible for based on the specific genetic abnormalities. And so this next generation sequencing testing can open options both in the routine clinical care, but also for potentially identifying for clinical trials. So in this video, we talked about the various sources of tissue um, from an endoscopic biopsy to imaging guided biopsies by core needle biopsy or actual surgical resections, which usually leads to the most amount of tissue available. And that this tissue is processed, fixed in formalin and paraffin embedded and stored in the pathology department for decades. And that this sample provides slides for routine clinical testing, but also for routine biomarker testing, either at the protein level or at the DNA level by immunostochemistry and or fish but also um, obtaining DNA for next generation sequencing. We talked about specific biomarkers, HER2, PDL1, mismatch repair deficiency, and soon to be Claudin 18.2, which are routinely tested in the stage four setting, as well as mismatch repair, which should be tested in the locally advanced setting, stage two and three. And we'll talk more about those when we get to the specific videos on therapy in the perioperative setting and also in the metastatic setting. Finally, it should be noted that this block, which again is stored in the pathology department, may prove useful in the event that you're screening for a clinical trial. Many clinical trials these days require tissue to be available 
to provide slides to test for a specific biomarker that is necessary, for example, for that therapy to be present, to be eligible for the study. Some studies require just blank slides to be available so that in the future, research can be performed on them to evaluate why a patient responded to the study therapy versus why a different patient did not. And occasionally, it's not uncommon for studies, even knowing that there's available tissue as a block available in the pathology department, they may require what's referred to as a fresh tissue biopsy, a new biopsy specifically to be processed and sent for trial to be eligible for studies. So when we talk about the video on clinical trials, we'll also touch on some of the criteria to be eligible. And one of them is available tissue at the time of enrollment. So in this first segment of principles of biomarker testing, we talked about the sources of the tissue, how they're obtained, and how they are processed. And then we talked about the difference between a prognostic biomarker and a predictive biomarker. And then we talked about routine biomarkers that are tested both in the stage four setting and in the perioperative setting for gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma, namely HER2 testing, mismatch repair testing, PDL1 testing, and soon to be Clodin 18.2 testing. And in addition to those routine biomarkers, augmenting our understanding of the biology of the cancer with next generation sequencing at the DNA level to assess for other potential genetic abnormalities that could be predictive biomarkers for other targeted and immunotherapies. Stay tuned for the next video, part two looking at assessing biomarkers in the blood using circulating tumor DNA. Thank you.